Hello and welcome to Education Talk. Now, this episode is dedicated to the victims of the Grenfell Tower fire in London, where 17 lives have been lost and there are many still unaccounted for. Relatives are still looking for their loved ones. I have here today in our studios, Professor Chrissy Mafidon, who was actually on the site and is here to tell us more. He's going to be part of the investigatory panel of what actually happened at Grenfell Towers. Dr. Chris, you're very welcome to our program. Thank you very much for inviting me. Now, talking about the relatives of the victims has been something of a poignant search for a lot of them. They are still looking for a lot of people which are still unaccounted for and authorities say it may take weeks before we know exactly what happened. Yes. Because this is worse than 9-11. 9-11 was a bomb out of nowhere, exploded, and the building collapsed. But in this case, there was smoke, the warning sign. There was fire in a flat before it went through the fourth floor. Then it went to the fifth floor. We should have done something, as humanity says today, we have enough in terms of technology to have stopped it on the fourth floor. We had enough. If the structure was not designed in such a way and refurbished in such a way that it literally self inflames, I mean, if you have inflammable materials there, what can really catch fire? And because what you need for fire is fuel, oxygen. And if you have those two, you have a wonderful combination. Anything that burns at below 40 degrees is highly, is, is a suspect, it will, will fuel it. So what pains me, what was really dreadful about it, it, A, it was totally avoidable, B, it was preventable, and three, it was containable. We could have contained it within only the first, fourth floor. How we managed to allow it to spread across all the way to the 24th floor is what really baffles me. Because this is London, we have, we have the facilities, we have the technology, we have the manpower, and it's right at the heart of London. We'll come and talk about the material that was used, which a lot of people say was very flammable. But first of all, let's listen to some people who are still looking for their loved ones and asking the authorities what exactly happened. Four children. The eldest, luckily he was not in the building. <laughs> And my cousin sister, and two cousin brothers, and my auntie. I spoke to her, and she, the very f last few words that she said to me was, "Please forgive me if I've said anything to upset you or hurt you. Um, I don't think we're going to make it out of the building." She was like, oh, "We're not going to make it. We can't make it. We can see flames under the door. We can see flames under the door." And I kept saying, "Try it and." See put things under the door to stop the smoke coming in and get low as you can and open the windows. Someone's going to come, call the fire brigade, do something, and then she stopped talking. And all I could hear was this crackling noise in the background because the phone was still on, but she wasn't saying anything. This is the worst thing I will remember in my life. I saw my uncle from the 17th floor, he opened the window, and he keeps shouting, please help us, get us out. And I keep looking at his helpless. Losing one member of my family, but losing all five, the whole entire family. I don't have my parents anymore. And you only get one set of parents in this world. And I had three siblings. They're all gone in the space of a couple of hours after leaving their house. They're all gone. And no one wants to give us any information about where their whereabouts are, if they're still within the building or not. Well, an emergency number has been set up for friends and families and relatives who are concerned about those who were at Grenfell Tower who are being looked for. And it's 0800 0961233. Anyone who is concerned can actually call that very number, 0800 0961233, for friends and families at the Grenfell Tower. Now, Dr. Professor Chris, you talked about the fire uh, it is believed that a fire started on the fourth floor, and what actually caused it? It was a fridge, uh, uh, and uh, the fridge ex exploded, the back of the fridge ex exploded with the gas, and if you have the gas and the explosion, they've had fluctuation in power 
supply to this same building before, and this was reported by the tenants. And you think the fluctuation was actually what caused the flow? Well, contributed to it. it. There's no way we can rule that out right now because they're saying uh, um, uh, there may be other aggravating um, circumstances. But it started with the fridge on the fourth floor. That's definite. That's known because the the, the origin of the flame started from the first floor, uh, from the fourth floor. So it's impossible for it, for it to have been started anywhere. The, the, smokes were still, the smoke was still coming out from the other fourth floor. And then the, the owner of the fridge knocked on the door of the person next door and told her, in the Mrs. Moses, that look, the, the, there's fire, there's fire, but I don't know what to do. I don't know how we're going to fight it's the it. owner of the fridge, uh, knocked they, on his neighbor's door, who was Mrs. Moses. And they told as many people, screamed and told as many people as possible that there was fire in the building. Which means the there building. were no fire alarms, there were no sprinklers in the building, uh, Absolutely, no, 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 no sprinklers at all. I mean, it, it, there's only one exit, there's only one fire exit in a 24-story building. That's another thing that amazes me. Oh, I cannot really reconcile how we can have four corners and not be able to have four different stairs leading people down just in case there is fire. Because we know that it's tall enough a building to catch fire any time because there are so many people living in the same place at the same time. So it, it's really uh, um, heart-rendering that nothing happened in the first 15 minutes. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. N there was no, nobody from the fire de department. There was no response. But it's right at the heart of London. It's Kensington. You can't get closer than the centre of London at Kensington. Well, footage has shown the fire spreading up on one side of the building before engulfing the whole building, and this is called the chimney effect. Yes. And you have the cloud in here explaining what exactly happened on Wednesday. Now, if you have a set of flats and then there are brick flats, it's possible that when the heat gets to the brick, the heat will have to go back because the, 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 you need a higher temperature for you to get the brick to burn. So the bricks will not burn under normal circumstances and not under uh, uh, so-called uh, um, 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 temperatures that, that we're looking at. But around the flat, it was recently insulated. So they put cladding around the flats. So if you put cladding around it, it means that, yes, it will help you retain heat. It will, it will prevent you losing heat during the winter. But in the summer, it therefore means that it's an envelope that can help you spread heat around. So the, the, the envelope surrounding the flat was something that conducted heat, was highly flammable, and the fire enveloped the building. So leaving the building became literally impossible. And people therefore started throwing anything they could get out of the building, took children and threw them out of the window, just threw them out of the building, because it was not enveloped by this special cladding. That was qu quite useful when, when, when it's winter. It really looks flammable, made of foil. Yeah, yeah made, made of foil. And there are two types of cladding. You can have the core center that is both resistant to cold and heat, and then you can have the least expensive cladding that is inflammable all the way through. And that's where the problem really uh, um, uh, starts, and that's where the investigation should really start. Why did we use a cladding like this in today's world where we have enough technology to know that and why is it that the local authority knows that because this is physically from the building this is not a cloud like it this is as a result of the fire that caught that that, that started in, in in i mean a few hours ago and it's still so uh, um frightening to think of it it's still shocking I'm, I'm still thinking somehow this is a dream somehow this will this will end. Somehow the people that were in the building that couldn't come out will be found miraculously. And that's, that's what I'm still hoping. Because it was avoidable. This is something that should have been avoided. And you're going to be part of the public inquiry. I, I'm, into I'm submitting evidence. This, I'm appearing why before this them. Happened. Yes. And concerns have actually been raised about uh, Grenfell Towers for over 20 years. We've had concerns from residents. And let's look at Matt Ruck of the Fire Brigades Union. He said something clearly had gone very badly wrong with the pre fire preventive procedures of the building. And not only that, we have the Grenfell Action Group. They had actually said before and during the refurbishment that the block constituted a fire risk, which means they knew 
that it wasn't safe for people to actually live in it. And the residents also warned that the site access emergency for emergency vehicles were, was actually severely restricted. So it's something very concerning because if they've had concerns for over 20 years, why hasn't anything been done about that? Fascinating. That's a great question. If you saw it coming, why didn't you prevent it? Partly because it's a local authority controlled flat. If it was a luxury flat, what was, we would never have, to, have had to discuss this. In Kensington, there are luxury flats. And the procedures and the facilities and the protections that those ones enjoy is radically different from the ones to the north of Notting Hill enjoys. And if you, I, I wish we could put a graph on, on the screen to, to, to show the demarcation between South Kensington and North Kensington. And the, the divide is not only geographical, the divide is only e as, as well economic and class. So you have the rich neighborhood and then you have the poor neighborhood. And that is what is so painful in an era where we thought some degree of equality, some degree of saneness, uh, the richest borough in the entire United Kingdom and one of the richest in Europe, if not the richest in the world, to suffer this calamity I mean, completely defies all, all, all reasoning. Well, one of the councillors was actually at the scene of the event and let's listen to what she had to say. Jessica's a 12-year-old vibrant young girl who's going to be turning 13 next month. Um, she's a lovely little girl with a bubbly personality and um, we're just worried and concerned about her. We just want her home. We want her back now. The family do as well. People have lost their lives because the corners were cut, because of cheap, you know, cheap decoration that didn't even need to be there. It's not fair. It's not fair. And the authorities don't care. They're not sending, they're not even asked. We were just saying, funnily enough, they, they, they're quick to, to, to call you when they want our rent paid and things like that, but they cannot call to check if we're okay. I know Egyptian families who live in there, I know Somalian families, I know white English people who live in there. We are a mix of everything and everyone. And we, we are such a tight-knit community. That this is just, it's more than devastated us. The material they use, it was burning on the outside. It was burning on the outside up. It wasn't the inside, it was the outside up. It was that material. It was cheap, flammable material. And that is so touching. That is Councillor Benazir there saying cheap materials were used. And this is the material that was literally used for cladding, which we can see is made of foil, so definitely is, is very flammable. Yeah, this came out of the block of flats. The real, the, the, the real thing, it's not something like it, it's a real reality. It was on the flat, as at this time last week, this was sitting on the flat. But today it's completely reduced. Why? Because the quality of the cladding is more important when you are doing things like this. But the, the landlord and the, and the local authority decided they were going to get something 4, 000, 4, about 4,500 or five, roughly 5,000 pounds cheaper. So for the cost of saving 5,000 pounds, we have lost lives. Right. And that, still many are unaccounted for. Yeah, and, and many are still missing. Many don't even know where the other person is. So they're trying, we're trying to contact the mobile phone uh, providers, we are trying to contact the network because if you can get contact the network, you can know where the phones that is attached to the network is. So we're using technology to try and identify the exact location of people or the exact location where the last phone call was made, so that you can say, okay, maybe the person is still where the last call was made. So, so we are now relying literally using phone as, um, if you like, tracking devices for humans that we knew went to bed Tuesday evening, happy and healthy. And on Wednesday morning, we don't know anything about them, nothing at all. And nothing has been seen or heard of them. I, I, and it's, it's so, it's so disappoint, disappointing, it's not even the word. We've run out of words in, in our lexicon to describe human feeling for people, innocent people, very innocent. If they've done something bad, it's a totally different thing. Going to bed and, and waking up, either in, burnt, roasted, or completely disappeared from the surface of the air. Because the landlord decided to save 5,000 pounds yeah, by because using the landlord a cheaper is, material. He's more interested in saving money than saving lives. I, I think that's it. It's, it's a society that has so elevated mammon and humanity has been completely degraded. I, I, I still don't believe that this can happen. This is London in 2017. Frightening, frightening.
Let's look at the advice that was given to people when they called 999 and when their relatives tried to call them to say, leave the building, the building is on fire. You said some of them were told to stay indoors, stay where they were, because they thought that the fire should be contained within the fourth floor where it started or within the apartment. Was than that, not just told, printed guidelines says your door is fireproof. So in the case of fire, shut the door, get a, a damp a, a blanket just around the door because they were hoping that the, the door would not burn and because the door would not burn, the yes. house, the, the flat would be contained, hoping that there would be bricks that surrounds it. But on this occasion, it was wrong because the bricks was not surrounded by fire. So it's, like, it's literally having a wall of fire around them. So most people that followed, uh, not most people, everyone that followed the set down rules and guidance in the case of fire outbreak died or it's still missing. The ones that went against it and opened the door and tried to escape were the ones that are living to tell the tales. And I physically met, discussed with them, and we're together uh, um, 12 hours after the event. And it's, it's sad, really, really sad, that we can give instructions that we are not able to test or verify. There's supposed to be fire drills at least once a week. There, there was nothing, nothing, nothing of such with, with the tenants. So it, it just, it's self-inflicted tragedy. That, that's, that's, the, that's the mildest way I can put it. The All-Party Fire Safety and Rescue Group actually told LBC that there are about 4,000 of such blocks in London that do not have any sprinklers or fire alarm systems in them. And for the landlord to use a cheaper material, what about building regulations? Uh, was it that the building regulations were not strict enough and he was able to bypass that? How was the building certified to be safe for humans to live in? Now, there are two rules for, for, for landlords. There's a social landlord, which is essentially a local authority, and there's a private landlord. The rules that apply to private landlord are stricter and more, much more uh, severely um, supervised. The, the, the local authority are literally a law to themselves because, remember, the local authority, in this case, is part of the lawmaking mechanism, is part of the law enforcing mechanism. So when you have such compromising position, it literally becomes impossible for you to be judge and jury in your own particular case. So the, 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 the building regulations were So they make the rules and they abide by a different set of rules. They make the rules and they decide which set of rules they can abide by. And if the rules is going to cost them money, they, they breach the rules. It, it's commonplace. Every, anyone that has ever been involved in local authority uh, um, dealings or anyone that has gone up to floors in any local government area, it doesn't matter whether it's labor control, conservative control, or liberal control, you will have seen the clear distinction between what is called luxury flats and the ones that are called just council flats or, or, or tar, tar blocks. Because you will see, right from when you enter the environment, you will know that there's a clear distinction between the number of parking spaces you have, you have to have by law if you are building luxury flat, now, the one you have to have by law if you are in a council uh, uh, owned tenant or council owned or maintained. And the luxury maintained flats apartment. are usually owned by private landlords. Yeah, so uh, uh, luxury flats are owned by private individuals or private landlords or uh, private groups. And, and the so called social housing, I, I'm, I'm using the word social housing, was supposed to be inexpensive, owned by the state to assist the citizens, not cheap and nasty and deadly debt traps. That, that, that's what they become. Because we've compromised on what standard is required to be maintained in such environment. Going forward, what should be done? What should the government do now? What should local authorities be compelled to do concerning tower blocks? We have about 4,000 tower blocks in London, and this could happen to any of them. There should be a central body, similar to Ofsted, that is totally independent of local authority, controlled by the central government that visits and inspects to make sure that the local authority owned or operated premises follow national guidelines. That's one. There should be sprinklers, there should be fire alarm systems. It, it, yeah, because if they follow the guidelines, it would be automatic that they will have sprinklers, just like the, uh, the, the luxury flats have. It would be automatic that they have fire exits. They will have fire exits in all four corners of the building just in case, so that you go for the nearest one. It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be funny to have this anymore, anywhere, because in, it's banned in some countries. You cannot use this in Australia. You cannot use this in the US. It's banned. You can't use it at all. 
because they have already seen disaster after disaster linked to this material. So uh, there should be a universal ban on this. Uh, it re re really shouldn't be debated at all. Did we have to wait for this disaster before deciding um, that this is no longer fit for use in buildings where humans live? I thought we didn't have to. I thought we could use logic. You know, sometimes I wonder what type of logic our leaders play by and, and what type of logic they walk by. Because if something is banned in one country, it's common sense for you to say, OK, let me find out why it's banned in that country. Let, let me find out what is the average temperature in that country. Let me see why they arrived at that decision and see whether we can learn from them instead of learning from disasters that has happened to us. A wise man learns from others, Le learns from others' mistakes. It may not necessarily be the leaders here, because just as you mentioned, is the local authority. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I really mean lead measures. Yeah, I really mean leadership at every level, whether it's national, regional, or local. Because if the head of the local authority had taken a decision to say, no, since there are questions raised about these materials, we will make sure that nobody uses it, and be on air on the side of safety, we will not be able to, we won't be telling this story. We're telling something totally different. If we err on the side of caution, we'll be telling a totally different thing. But if you say, oh no, it's going to cost more. They spent 10 million pounds renovating this building less than 24 months ago. 10 million pounds. What should viewers do, viewers who want to help? Please, uh, we wanted you to demonstrate humanity because one hope, life has been lost, uh, limbs have been lost, and then hope is in short supply. What we want is hope from other people that can strengthen them and say, yes, there is hope, something else can happen. If you have any unused materials, any beddings, you should please come down and help the people. If we don't have anything, just come down. It's just coming down and helping, for instance, carry water from one sector to the other because the entire churches in the areas have been converted to re uh, refuge centers. So Kensington High Street, um, Kensington Temple, all of them now have beddings in them and really showing love, because this is the opportunity for you to show your Christian value, show your, your belief, and manifest your faith in terms of working and holding hands and being just a shoulder for somebody to cry on and say, look, all is not lost. You can recover everything. You can move from having absolutely zero, like we, we, we saw uh, in the Bible. I mean, we saw Job. Job lost literally everything and was able to come back. So that's what I want people to be able to tell other residents and people directly affected by it that, look, you can recover like Job. You can get twice of everything. And let's see how we can pray with them, support them, get copies of Rasuti if, if, you, if you have some spare ones, and share it with people and say, there is hope. Because hope is in very, very, very limited supply. Where people, it's, it's a hopeless situation, literally. Uh, you see adults breaking down on the street and crying and weeping because we were looking at the fire. We were looking at the fire. We couldn't do anything. You can't go in, and the people in can't come out. And then what do you do? And you know that your blood relations is in, in there. You know that people that you know, people that you've been together, you've shopped together, people you've used the same amenities together are right inside there. And all we did was look at red fire, saw red fire, saw smoke coming from the other side, saw tiny um, um, water. We, we could literally see that the, the fire brigade, the heights, you know, was about 32 meters, 105 feet. That's, that's the aerial platform. And you're talking about a building that is 20 stories high, about yes. 24 uh, stories. So there was no way the fire brigade, the aerial platform could get to them. And a lot of people have requested for materials. You talked about Christian materials being sent to them to help. Yeah, books, because you, you need to give them hope because they really need hope. They need hope. They need to know why they are li living. They, they, because they're asking questions, why me? What did I do wrong? Uh, what will alive. happen next? So they're questioning, questioning, asking a lot of questions, and we can provide that as, as children of hope. Thank you very much, Professor Chris. Thank you for coming on the program. Viewers, this is Education Talk. We've been talking about the victims of the Grenfell Tower and every help that they need. You can actually send Christian materials to them. Go there to help, whichever way you can. If you have any questions, you can send emails to info at loveotv.co.uk. Enjoy the rest of our programs.